So everybody, I'm going to share with you first of all some matters of approach uh, when it comes to explaining um, lessons from the Quran or Tafsir studies. Uh, I think this is a good opportunity for me to talk to you about you know, the way I approach my own research and my own study and the kinds of lectures that I do uh, and different kinds of lectures that I do even on the same subject matter. So, you know, I've been a, a student of the Quran for nearly 15 years now and the more I study it, the more I realize that we don't actually have a systematic approach, like a proper, like a, a well-developed approach to analyzing the Quran in contemporary times. We have the tafsir literature, there's a lot of scholars in our history that wrote about the Quran and wrote analysis of every single ayah, but even that material is all over the place, right? So I, I personally come from an IT background, and I, you know, from, a, from a corporate background, and I like things to be systematic and organized. And I found in, in this ocean that it was actually kind of all over the place. This, this, uh, this study is all over the place. And the first thing I tried to do was study Arabic. And Arabic is actually, I, I was fortunate to find a really ingenious teacher who took a really complex subject like Arabic but turned it into the study of mathematics. Like it's almost like scientific how you study it. And it's really like formulaic. You can, you can get to a result very, very quickly and efficiently, right? So we're studying something ancient. I, I studied something ancient, but I studied it in a modern method. Right? And I tried to bring that approach to Quranic studies. We're studying something ancient, we're studying the tradition of Islam, we're studying the text of the Quran, the Lughat, the linguistics and all of it, but I'm going to try to study it in a way that I can actually present in easy language, inshallah. So, the, this has been a pretty interesting journey. The hardest part of my job is not the research. I actually have now a research team. There's, I don't do the research alone anymore. It's way too much to do for one person. So we'll go through maybe 20 tafasir, several lexicons, every ayah has maybe 20 pages of notes on one ayah. Right? And we have all this information collected, but that's never going to be something I lecture about. It's never going to be that, because that's not going to make sense to any of you. It barely makes sense to me. You have to take all that information, and then you have to spend twice that amount of time trying to make sense of that information, and thinking about how do you tell this to someone and they just get it. Right? And you have to sift through the information that really matters, and the information that's kind of, it's cool that it's there, but it's not necessarily something you need to talk about. So you have to, you have to you know, decide what is priority and what is not priority. And that's probably the hardest part of my job. Some of you are in the audience, some of you do halaqas and talks and lectures and khutbahs and things like that in some small circle. My advice to you guys is don't just regurgitate what you learn. When you read something in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, or when you read something in a, in a, in a sirah book or something else, don't just repeat it. Understand it for yourself, make sense of it for yourself. It's less important that I quote a thousand names to you. Sheikh so and so said this, this one said this, that one said this, this one said this. When you get flooded with quotes, what do you remember? Tell me what you remember. <laughs> Nothing. You don't remember anything. The purpose of a lecture or a talk or a discussion is not that you, I do appreciate how many names I can quote. That's not the point. The point is, there are some very valuable lessons and ideas and wisdom that is captured in this work. And I need to, the ideas are far more important than the formalities of the names, you understand? My own criticism of what I heard as a, growing up and trying to learn about Islam is, a lot of times what I heard in lectures were lots of names and lots of quotes, and I couldn't make sense of them. It was just way too much information. And it wasn't being presented in a way that I could say, oh, okay, I get that, okay, I, I understand. I, now I understand it enough that I can even talk to somebody else about it. You know? And that's the approach that I'm going to be taking with Surah Al-Kawtha. It's not going to be this like exhaustive, elaborate tafsir study where I compare what Imam Razi and you know, Zamaq Shadi says, you know, or what Ibn Kathir and Qurtubi and Tabari and Jalalain and Ibn Ashur and <laughs> the list is pretty long. And what they all have to say. And what the Sana al-Arab says about this word and what, you know, and Bakr al muqid says. You don't have to know these names and I'm not trying to show off or anything. But I am telling you, it can be pretty overwhelming if you take that approach. And you're not going to know, some sisters have the genetic disorder, they write everything down. So they write everything down and they're like, what did I just write down? You know? <laughs> so, good guys don't have that problem, obviously. <laughs> so, anyway. So I'm going to break this down, inshallah ta'ala, as though this is uh, me teaching Surah al at Sunday school to 12 year olds. You're much smarter than that, but I'm, I'm going to pretend that that's what I'm doing. Okay? So Surah al is the shortest surah in the Quran, 
of one of the most powerful <coughs> messages given to the Prophet Sallallahu at a time where he was in one of the most painful moments of his life. His child had just passed away. His son has just passed away. And now I need you to understand how life used to look like at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu some things about it. Back in the day, uh, you know, you had these homes which had very small rooms. And instead of having a front porch, like people have a front porch and a lawn kind of thing that overlooks the street, that was fenced off. So it was like a big wall in front. So your front porch has a wall in front of it, right? And that's part, that's considered part of your home. So a lot of the cooking and talking and relaxing used to happen under the sky. Because you had this space in front of your house which was under the sky, okay? And it's kind of like your living room, but it doesn't have a roof. Okay, so your bedroom has a roof, and your other, other rooms have a roof, but your living room doesn't have a roof. And it's touching your neighbor's house, which is designed the same way. So they have a front porch, which is basically their living room. Now what that does is, your neighbor better be someone you can trust, because when you're talking in your living room, who can hear it? Your neighbor can hear everything. There's just one wall separating both sides, right? So now the Prophet has this horrible, horrible event in his life. His, his beloved son passes away, newborn, right? He passes away. And there's crying in the house, and there's sadness in the house. And the next door neighbor, wall over, is Abu Lahab. Okay, so Abu Lahab, who happens to be his uncle. Okay? And Abu Lahab, he got his nickname not just from the redness of his hair, Lahab means a, a red flame. He didn't just get the name as a nickname because he was a redhead and a red beard, but also because he had an inflared temper. Like the guy used to lose his cool a lot, and he used to in flame, literally, in getting engulfed in flame. So he had a pretty ravaged, a pretty insane temper, and really harsh with his words. It could burn you with his words, right? So that's kind of like how he got his nickname. In any case, the news travels over, obviously, because it's only a wall separating the two, that the child has passed away. Now, Abu Lahab on good terms with the Prophet or no? No, not with the Prophet But still he's family, isn't he? He's still an uncle. He's still an uncle. Now, I, got, I know you guys don't watch movies and stuff, but there are movies where enemies go to battle against each other in ancient times, right? And then the king on the one hand, and the general on the other hand, the general gets the news that the enemy's king lost their child. So even they come up and send a letter of condolence and say, we are enemies on the battlefield, but today you have lost a child, there will be no fighting today. I will give you a day of mourning and I feel your pain. Like, there was this nobility among enemies kind of thing. You know, honor among enemies even. That they would acknowledge something as personal as a child dying, you know? And they wouldn't say, oh, I'm glad your child died or things like that. They wouldn't do that. Now what happens with Abu Lahab, even though they're enemies because of Islam, and because he hates the message of Islam, and he thinks it's ruining the tribe and all of these things, but he's still family. I mean, your uncle could be a Abu Lahab, but he's still your uncle. <laughs> You know, and a baby just died. So maybe this is the time for you to show some softness, you know. And what you can hear from the other side of the wall is an, is an, is an angry man happy for the first time. You can hear Abu Lahab elated, overjoyed, laughing at the top of his lungs and saying, Batara Muhammad, Batara Muhammad. Muhammad's name is finally going to be discontinued. Finally, no one left to carry his name. Ha <laughs> ha! And that's what he, and that's what his family, what the prophet can hear, what the family can hear. And then he comes out of the house. Abu Dhabi comes out of the house, and he's walking around on the streets, declaring with joy that the baby has died. And that's what they can. That's what this family can hear. Now, if that came from your enemy, it would be painful. This is coming from your own family. This is coming from your own family. So I want you to understand, people can hurt you, but no one can hurt you like your family. Nobody can cause you pain like your own. They are closer to you, you have less walls between you and them, both, both physically and you know, emotionally speaking, there are less barriers. When somebody else from the outside speaks ill of you, who cares, who cares about them anyway, I don't have to listen to this, but when your own uncle, your own cousin, your own brother, your own mother, your own father, your own child, when they speak in hurtful language, when they say hurtful words, oh boy, it hurts. And this is more than just hurtful words. He's celebrating the death of a child. At the, at the weakest moment when people need to hear a consolation, right? This is a time where you want to just hear words of comfort. If you can't say anything comfortable, at least just leave me alone. Just don't say anything. Just don't hurt me. 
But he does this. He sees it as, as an opportunity to stab the Prophet and his family in their moment of pain. And he takes it. He takes those shots. I mean, this guy, there's a reason that of all the enemies of Islam, there are so many enemies of Islam, aren't there? Only one enemy of Islam is named by name in the Quran. So there's no confusion which member of hell is being talked about. Allah will say, Al-Ladheena Kafaru, Al-Kuffar, Al-Insan. Sometimes He'll use all these different kinds of words. You know, Yaqulu Al-Insanu Yawma Idhin, Ayn Al-Bafar. Ara'ayta Al-Ladhee Tawala. Did you see the one who turned away? And Sahaba will wonder, is that Walid ibn Mughira who turned away? Is he talking about Abu Jahl who turned away? Is he talking about, who's he talking about when he says he turned away? And every Sahabi has their own opinion. But when Allah says, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tabba, there ain't no confusion. Was that about Abu Jahl? Or was that about Abu Lahab? Was that about, no. It's clear as day that this is specifically about Abu Lahab. So Allah has, Allah has anger on Abu Lahab like he has anger on nobody else. Like nobody else. On this particular man. And you have to understand that this, he's caused the Prophet ﷺ pain in ways that nobody else has caused him. And some of the harshest pain that he's caused to the Prophet ﷺ is not by, by his hand. Not because he hit him or he tortured him, but because of the words. Because of him being abusive as a member of family. What is the first lesson that we need to extrapolate before we even begin talking about this surah? Is that we have to be careful about the words we use with our family that Allah does not take lightly. Allah does not take that matter lightly. People think that within their family they can say whatever they want. You know, when you're outside, when you're meeting with your friends, when you go at the masjid, or when you're at work, or when you're at school, you're the nicest person. Everybody thinks he's the nicest guy. Wow, Sharif, he's a great guy. <laughs> Ask his wife. <laughs> you know? And same thing with her. She's the nicest person. She's so kind. She's so soft. You should see her at home. <laughs> You know, she makes the Hulk look calm. <laughs> so, so that happens. People are the worst to their family sometimes. This is why the Prophet ﷺ in his incredible sunnah, you know, attempted to reverse that trend. <laughs> the best of you are the best to their families. You know, it, it doesn't mean anything if you come to me and say, you've impacted me so much in my life and I love your videos and I've seen some of you. Get out of the picture. <laughs> that doesn't mean much, but if my, if my mom is disappointed with me, if my spouse is disappointed with me, if my children think I'm mean, then all of this is meaningless. None of this matters. What matters is your family. How you are with them and how they are with you. Right? So that's, that's the first thing I want to bring to your attention. Now, Allah is going to respond to Abu Lahab and this situation. And the pain that the Prophet is experiencing at the loss of a child. I, for one, you know, we, 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 want to, we want to try to empathize and to try to feel what the Prophet felt. And I know I met some people who lost children in the audience. I met a, a, you know, a, a couple who lost their baby when they were two days old. And Allah will continue to give them some. It's their one year anniversary now that they lost the baby. And may Allah Azza wa reunite them in Jannah, you know. But you know, for those of us that have children, I have I have six and a half kids, seventh one on the way. You know, So six and a quarter. Anyway, uh, uh, so you know, to just even think about losing a child, I can't do it. I'm not capable of even thinking it. I, I have nightmares, like maybe once in a year I might have a nightmare where one of my kids got hurt and I wake up crying like a baby. I literally wake up crying like a baby. Yesterday she thought this thing was talking about when he hears his baby cry and he can tell that his baby, baby's crying. I cannot. I can't. I can tell my babies from the smell of the diaper. <laughs> yep, that's my Mars. I'll be back. <laughs> but anyway, there you, yes, it is gross, I know. But you learn to like it over time. You learn to just... Yeah, okay, bananas, okay. But, you know, it just, it comes. It comes. <laughs> you know. But it's not something we can even imagine. And that, that pain, that suffering that somebody goes through, is a, it's probably one of the most difficult experiences somebody can have in their life. You know. And he's going through that experience, and Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to give him consolation. He's going to talk to him, and he's going to make him feel better. And that's Surah al -Kawsha. It's Allah consoling the Prophet That's what Sufi Kautam is about. At the end of the day, that's all it is. 
Our messenger has a job to do. He's got the biggest mission ever given in humanity. He only has a limited number of years to do it. He has to deliver a word to these people who are in the middle of the Arabian desert and that word is going to, like a ripple in a pond, it's going to ripple out of there and it's going to shake the Roman and the Persian and you know the empires, it's going to reach China. There's going to be millions of Muslims one day in China. There's going to be people in India and Africa. There are going to be Muslims in Europe. And they're all going to be a result of this word that is coming down to him. So he needs to be in an emotionally healthy state. And even the Prophet ﷺ can get overwhelmed, can, get, can feel overly depressed and sad, as he did when this incident happened. He's a human being at the end of the day. So every human being needs consolation. We need to be emotionally healthy to be able to do our job even within the religion. And the greatest man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the greatest job, also needed consolation. His consolation and his comfort, his comforting words, his counseling words, were the words of Allah, were the Qur'an. That's why Allah gave him the Qur'an on many occasions. Just so sometimes the Qur'an came not to give any da'wah. Sometimes the Qur'an didn't come, tell the Kufar this, tell the Quraysh this, tell the people of the book this, tell the Jews this. No, no, no. It only came to calm the Prophet down, to make him feel better. That's a very powerful thing that this word that is relevant until the Day of Judgment, one of its functions is to make you feel better. One of its fundamental purposes is to give you calm. Is to, to help you in your moments of sadness. That Allah acknowledges that, subhanAllah. That these, this is a big deal. You know, the battles are not the battles are not the only big deal. But the Rafaqat and Ahzab aren't the only thing, even though we've reduced our entire history to the battles. That's what we've done. But the battle that happens inside of someone, the emotional turmoil, the earthquakes that rattle somebody on the inside, they are also a very, very big deal. Then you appreciate that Allah Azza wa Jal, instead of giving him long, exhaustive, you know, counsel and sessions where he could you know make him feel better gave him the shortest surah in the entire Quran. You would think if somebody's going for twelve hours, maybe reveal something as long as Baqarah or something. <laughs> you know, so they feel better. What are we learning? People don't want to you want to console people but you don't want to overdo it. You want to give them something that can make them feel better and you need to leave them give, give them time to be. You understand? That's why sometimes people that are going through a tough time, you want to be there for them, but you also want to be able to give them their space. They need their space too. They need time to work things out themselves. Now let's begin this remarkable, remarkable surah. Allah says, Inna a'taynaka al-kawthar. Inna means no doubt be. Inna is used in Arabic, bi izalat al shak to remove any possibility of doubt. As if to say, what I'm about to say is going to be hard to believe. You know, for sh when you start your statement by saying there's no doubt at all, it is almost assuming that you're going to have doubts about what I say. Okay, so the, the, the function needs to be understood. And it is we, in fact, inna a'tayna. This what is called in Arabic, this is, you know, so those of you are familiar with some grammar, it's inna ismiya. But the way this is done with the khabar as a fi'id, I know it's getting too technical, but I can't help myself. I'll simplify in a second. Is an ifbatu li ghayrid fa'id. What that means is, no doubt, it is we, in fact, and no one else. It is we, in fact, that have given you. No one else has given you, it is us that has given you. Now why is that important? What has happened to him is he's just lost a child, yes? He's lost a child. And instead of Allah saying, we have taken from you, he's saying we have given you. Wait, this is about taking or giving? I'm not sure now. And he says, nobody else has given you, I have. So you need to stop thinking about what's been taken and you need to start thinking about what's been given. The Prophet's mentality is being shifted entirely towards the positive. When you are going through a crisis, your mind, the Qur'an forces your mind to think about what you have, not what you've lost. It's forcing the Prophet ﷺ to think about what he's been given. And it's only been given by Allah. And by the way, the word to give in Arabic is ata, ata, to give someone. But when you say a'ta, a'ta, it's actually a substitute of two letters. In the word ata, you hear an alif. In a'ta, you hear a ayn, yes? And the ayn and the alif are close to each other. This is why when people learn Arabic, they think everything has a ayn. So they say, Alhamdulillah, assalamu alaykum, ala 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 If they ayn everything, it's Arabic. Like, my sister makes fun of me because I teach Arabic. She goes, she calls me and she doesn't know anything about Arabic. She goes, assalamu alaykum, naman, how are you? You wanna have the ayn? That would be yes, you know. So long as it's Ayn, then it must be good Arabic, you know? <laughs> but the point is, Ayn is hard to pronounce, right? <coughs> 
So uh, the alif in this verb has been replaced with a ayn. And the ta, a ta, has been replaced with a ta, a ta. So two letters that are tougher, grander, more difficult, have been replaced with two letters that are easier. This is rhetorically done in Arabic because these are synonyms, to give and to give. Ata means to give, a'ta means to give. But a'ta is actually when you give something grand and something big, something that's not a, just a casual thing. A'taytuka qadaman, I gave you a pen. You don't say a'taytuka qadaman, I granted you a pen. <laughs> How big is this pen that you can give me? <laughs> world's biggest pen or something, you know, that would be a'ta. So what the Prophet is about to be told sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then, is that what he's about, what he has been given, is no small thing. Is no, if it was just given, and now imagine this, usually Allah when he talks about the previous revelations, a'taynahum wal kitab, we gave them the book, not a'taynahum wal kitab. A'tayna, we gave them previous revelations, a'tayna. What the Prophet's about to be told, a'taynaka. We have granted you no small thing. Now what is it that he has granted him? He says, al-kawthar, al-kawthar. And this is really the heart of the surah. If we understand al-kawthar, inshallah, everything will start making sense. The word al-kawthar comes from the word kathura in Arabic, which means to be much, to become plenty. Okay? Now, the, the, in, the, uh, the muscular form, what's called the infinitive form, is kathra, plentiness. Plentiness. Or Urdu speakers, kasrat. Ye badi kasrat se baat karte hai. That sort of thing, okay? That's, that's kathura. It comes from kathura in Arabic. Now, the word for much is al kathir. Al kathir. So if you say, we have given you much, inna aqina al kathir. Inna aqina ka al kathir. Oh, okay, we've given you a whole lot of much. I know that's not English, but still. That would mean, inna a'tayna kan shakur, fa'ud. That's not what Allah chose to say either. He used a pattern of Arabic that is used highly unusual. Fawa'ad it's called. Inna a'tayna kan thawutha. Meaning, we have given you much that can't even be compared to the plentiness of anything else. Nothing else in its plentiness can be compared to what I have given you. Now, you know when, for example, you fill a glass with water. If you fill it all the way to the... Hada kathir! Hada kathir, if you fill it over and it starts spilling over, hada kathir! It's way too much! Way too much! But kawthar means you filled it in a way that never, nothing ever has been filled like this before. So the Prophet's being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have given you so much, and so much, and so much, and so much, and so much, that you can't even compare it to anything else. The Prophet is being made to feel overwhelmed in gratitude at a time where he's supposed to be thinking about sadness. I have given you so, 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 so much. And now I'm already given it to you. The Prophet in the narration will describe that within kawthar, not the only meaning of kawthar, within the meanings of kawthar is al hawb fil jannah. You know the pond in jannah? The river in Jannah that we're going to be drinking from, that the Prophet has been given, you must have heard this before, right? That's the meaning of Kawthar, but it's within the meaning of Kawthar, not the only meaning of Kawthar. Now we have to think about what the Prophet has been given. When he, sallallahu alayhi wa has been given, I wish I had a mic to walk around with this like alien tripod thing, I can't move around, but anyway. I'll tell you, we have to take, take this a step back. Our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with a mission. And I need you to understand, according to the Quran, what is the summary of that mission? The summary of the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to fulfill or to complete what Ibrahim started. I'll say that again. The mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to complete what Ibrahim Alaihi Salam started. Ibrahim Alaihi Salam left everything at the command of Allah, made the most incredible sacrifices for the sake of Allah, left and Allah has inspired him to go in the middle of a desert, Mecca. De Mecca, by the way, not a pretty place. And at the time that Ibrahim goes there, not even a city. Black rock because of the heat, intense desert environment, no human being should be out there, not on their own accord anyway, and he's taken his wife and his baby out in the middle of the desert. You know the story. You tell me, if it's not for the Kaaba, if it's not for the Kaaba and that hideous satanic looking tower, <laughs> what is the reason for you to go to Mecca? Why would anybody say, ah, I think I'm going to go on a vacation? 
Makkah seems like the right spot. Because of the great weather? No, no, it must be because of the great people. <laughs> Why would you go to Makkah? There's no reason for a human being to go there. The only reason, the only reason that place in the world is even a city is because of what? The God. So Ibrahim builds, builds this foundation. He makes a dua that one day everybody from all corners of the world will come here. People will save their money and not go to Hawaii. People will save their money and not go to some vacation. People will save and cry and beg Allah that I don't want to see waterfalls. I don't want to see you know, the, the, the famous cities in the world. I don't want to see the tallest mountain. I just want to see the site of the house that was built by Ibrahim I just want to see that. People will beg, they'll, they'll, they'll save up their whole lives to be able to go. You know, there are people from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh. Some people actually go on foot to this day. On to this day. I met an uncle who came on, on a bicycle from Peshawar. To Hajj. He left six months before. What a gangster. I mean, he was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's serious business right there. But what, who put that, that love inside the believer from all over the world to be able to go there? You know, there was one time, there was this story of a scholar who was traveling towards Hajj and he saw a man who didn't have legs and he was dragging his body with his hands. And he said, what are you doing? Do you need a ride? He says, no, I don't need a ride. I just want to do this on my own. And he said, what are you doing? Where are you going? He goes, I'm going to Hajj. He said, Hajj, we're in Syria. When do you expect to get there? It's, it's going to take you years. To, this, you might even die on the road. He goes, As for the distance, my love of seeing that house will make it near. <laughs> That's good enough for me. I'm going. Allah put something in our hearts, man, towards that Kaaba. And you know who started it? It was the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That one dua he made. That one dua he made that we should have a soft corner in our hearts for the Kaaba is still alive. The Prophet's job وسلم, was to liberate that same house that Ibrahim built وسلم, to restore it to its original purpose. That was his mission. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, now you will understand that our entire religion is actually one of its names is Millata Abikum Ibrahim, the religion of your father Abraham. We, another name of Islam is the religion of Ibrahim. Why is that? Now if you think about the pillars of Islam, if you think about the pillars of Islam, the Shahada, which is Tawheed, is clearly directed to Ibrahim When you think of fasting, you think of the journey of Ibrahim when he demonstrated the silliness of people who worship the sun and the moon, and he said, "La would afini." I don't love those who settle. When he talked about the sun settling, I don't love those who settle. Yes. So you'll notice the pra the prayers are directly associated with the the position of the sun moving from one place to the other. It's actually a fulfillment of that statement of Ibrahim salam. We acknowledge the weakness and the flailing, the moving nature of the sun because every time it changes its position, we remember that it is Allah in charge, not the sun. SubhanAllah. And as a matter of fact, when the sun goes all the way down, our loud prayers begin. Acknowledging that only Allah is supreme when even the sun is gone. Right? So the loud prayers are Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr, all of them taking place in the dark. Even the prayers are directly going back to who? Ibrahim By the way, his dua, Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as salati wa bi dhuriyati. Make me the one who establishes the prayer and out of my offspring too. Even that goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Hajj, well, before Hajj, fasting. Somebody could argue, how does fasting connect to Ibrahim alayhi salam? It does. Ibrahim alayhi salam made a prayer. He said, Yatu alayhi mayatihi wa yuzakihim wa yuzakihim wa yuzakihim wa yuzakihim wa yuzakihim wa yuzakihim Allah sent a prophet among them who will read your book to them. Who will read your ayat to them. He made a dua that among the children of Ismail, there should be someone who gets revelation. Who was the fulfillment of that dua? The Prophet the, And the Prophet started reciting Allah's ayat just like Ibrahim asked. And what are these ayat? The Quran, yes? When did the Quran come down? When the Quran come down, Laylatul Qadr, yes? Laylatul Qadr belongs in the month of Ramadan. And Allah is so 
Allah wants us to be so grateful for that one night when revelation began, that celebrating it one night just wasn't enough. He turned their celebration into an entire month. That's why Allah says, Shahu Ramadan and the Unzila bihi Quran. The month of Ramadan is the one in which the, the Quran was sent down. It was actually sent down in one night, but one night just won't cut it. It has to be turned into 30 days of celebration. The entire month of Ramadan is a celebration that Quran came. And Quran coming is a dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's what the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay, that takes care of one Eid. What about the other Eid? When do we do that? Hajj. Hajj has nothing to do with Ibrahim. Wait, hold on. Everything you do at Hajj has to do with Ibrahim alayhi salam. You go to the Kaaba because of Ibrahim alayhi salam. You do the Jamaat because of Ibrahim alayhi salam. You sacrifice the animal because of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Everything you do goes back to who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then, then there's zakat, that's the only thing left. And zakat, when he made dua to, the, to Allah azza wa jal, that these people should eat all kinds of fruit and they should enjoy all kinds of provision. <coughs> Allah wanted to make sure that the provision they enjoy is not a curse against them, but a favor for them. So he made sure he gave them something that can make the things we enjoy an actual blessing, not a curse. How do you make your risk, your provision, a blessing for yourself? You give zakat. Every ritual of Islam goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now you need to, now why did I say that? The Prophet sallallahu was told, I have given you the most incredible good. You know what the most incredible good is? That you get to fulfill the legacy of your father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. I have given you that. You may have lost your child, but I have connected you to your father. I have connected you to your father. And you need to be happy for that. And you may have lost a child, but you will have people that will love you more than any child could ever love a father. You will have an ummah, and they will grow, and they will grow, and they will grow, and the only thing you can describe that with is the word kawfa. You will have the ayat of the Quran, and each ayah will have so many gems, and so much wisdom, and so much guidance, it will transform so many lives, that this one ayah keeps giving, and giving, and giving, that every ayah can only be described as kawfa. You will have a legacy, you will have companions. These companions will be people that will satiate the inspiration for generations to come, no matter where they live, what language they speak. They will all know the name of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq They will know who Ibn Abbas was, they will know who Ali was, they will know who Umar was. And those Sahaba themselves and their legacy will be part of your al kawtha there will be people all over the world, whenever they hear your name, they will say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which will increase your rank and it will keep on increasing and increasing like no human being has ever been increased. That is the count that I have given you. When you tell someone you've given them an amazing favor, and that's all they're immersed in, that's all they're thinking about is the favor that Allah has given them, then you think about how do I become thankful to Allah, isn't it? So what is the second ayah of the surah? Now think about that. Pray, pray before your master and sacrifice. By the way, prayer and sacrifice are directly the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Aren't they? Both of those things are supposed to be a fulfillment when he fulfilled all of his tests. When Ibrahim alayhi salam passed all of his tests, then he was to sacrifice an animal. Now you are having granted the ultimate good, so you can celebrate just like your father when they celebrate. You should sacrifice. You should pray and you should sacrifice. By the way, prayer and sacrifice go together on the day of Eid. Yes? You pray and then you sacrifice. So this is actually the Quran's way of describing Eid. A day of celebration. The day of the Prophet's greatest morning is now being described by the Quran as a day of great Celebration. Be overjoyed by the good that Allah has given you. What are we being told in this remarkable short speech? This is three ayah. It's an incredible short speech. And in, these, in this second ayah, what we're being told is what will bring Muslims optimism in an age of pessimism? In an age when everything seems to be going wrong, where everything seems to be heading in the wrong direction. Then you do that. You think about what Allah has given you. He has made you and me part of al kawtha We are part of the gift to the Prophet Every believer is. Every believer is someone the Prophet is grateful for. Every one of them. Every one of them he testifies for on Judgment Day, including ourselves. So we have to be grateful now as by, by proxy. We have to pray and we have to sacrifice. You know?
By the way, when you sacrifice, what do you do with the meat other than making burgers? What do you do? You give it away. You make it a source of other people's joy. Yes or no? Not only should you be overjoyed, but your joy should spread to others. Not only should you be optimistic, you should be a source of optimism for others. If you understand Sunnah al-Kawtham, Muslims, the believer who is inspired by the Surah, not only is the only positive one in a negative time, they are the, they are the source of positivity for others in a negative time. Unlike our current situation, where we are the only negative people, even if there's something positive happening. We are incredible at pessimism. We are amazing at it. So when you have anything good happen, you think about what could be possibly wrong with this. <laughs> Brother, that was a, like, like people like to, to like highlight the things that are not there. Brother, so many people came to this convention, but what about all the people who didn't come? <laughs> God. It's so hard to talk to you, negative uncle. It's so hard. Why are you always negative? You know, even if the, high, the wife makes a delicious meal, yeah, it's good today, but tomorrow you're probably not even going to cook. <laughs> Why? Why do this? You know, there, there are husbands and wives that are in a perpetual state of pessimism. One day they had a good day. They went out to dinner, they chatted, they talked for a change. Oh, it's such a good day. I wish every day could be like this, but I know it's not going to be. So I might as well just go back to normal. <laughs> Just on the drive back from the restaurant, you just shut it down. Like, no, we're not, we're not into happiness. <laughs> you know? People, we're, we're now perpetually inclined towards a state of pessimism. We're just negative all the time. We're expecting bad things to happen. We're actually expecting people to hurt our feelings. We're expecting people to disappoint us. We're expecting to be a disappointment to other people. Allah Azza wa is now describing something that's one of the most powerful motions in our religion. If you internalize this, you'll have a happy life. You'll have a peaceful life. If you don't internalize this, Really. So many people, their happiness and their emotional state depends on other people. Their happiness depends on other people. Let me tell you about other people. Doesn't matter if it's your parents or your children or your spouse. It doesn't matter if it's your best friend or your teacher. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Making people happy is a canyon that has no bottom, my friend. You will never get there. Nobody will ever be happy with you. They're always going to be a disappointment in some way or the other. Even if they're happy with you, it's going to be temporary. It's going to be temporary. And so long as you feel like you have to make this person happy, or they have to make you happy, you will live a miserable life. You will be miserable your entire life. Because your happiness is pegged on another human being. As a matter of fact, in this remarkable ayah, the Prophet's happiness وسلم, could not even be pegged to this beautiful baby who passed away. Your happiness cannot even depend on this baby. It can't. Your, your positivity will come from appreciating all the good that Allah has given you. And when you appreciate that, you will turn your attention back to Allah. And when you sacrifice for the sake of Allah, you will give other people whether they give you or not. You don't pass out the meat to the uncle who's nice to you and the cousin you like. You pass it out to everybody, yes or no? In other words, you will be a giver even if other people are not givers to you. If other people don't fulfill you emotionally, they leave you bankrupt inside, they leave you feeling empty inside, you will be a source of giving anyway. But what about the person who's hurting your feelings? Because you know, you could say, just like the Prophet could say, that's all great, thanks for the speech about positivity, but my uncle still hates me. And he still says mean things. And my cousin still doesn't like me. And my older brother's always cruel to me. And my mom keeps saying the meanest things. And sometimes, you know, I, I've given lots of lectures on the rights of parents. I have. 
promise you, they're on YouTube, I think they are on YouTube, don't get mad at afterwards. But there are lots of parents who are abusive. Lots of parents who are abusive. And they're abusive in the name of Islam. Like parents have absolute rights in Islam. They, my friends, do not have absolute rights in Islam. They have responsibilities and rights like everybody else. The only one who has absolute rights in Islam is Allah and His Messenger. We obey them no matter what. Parents cannot be abusive. They cannot be mean. You cannot continue to call your daughter fat or ugly and nobody's going to marry you and you're too old and you're such a disappointment. You cannot continue to call your son a loser, even if he is. <laughs> you can't do that. You have an obligation to your children to be a source of support. You cannot be a constant nag. You cannot. Now, the people who are hurting you, and I'm not giving this, you, your parents are not going to change and you're not going to change, maybe, you know, but you know what, and some people won't change, no matter, the, if there was one person who was capable of changing someone, it was the Prophet's wife, and he can't even change his uncle, who lives next door? I mean, the one who he has the most human contact with possible, outside of his family, is his next door neighbor uncle, and he happens to be the worst enemy of all, what is that teaching you and me? We cannot change people, we can't change people. And people come to me and say, brother, my, my cousin, my wife, my husband, we have a problem. Tell me something I can say to them that will change them. <laughs> and I say, Allah gave the Prophet the Quran and it couldn't change Abu Lahab. What do you want me to say? <laughs> Sometimes you can't change people. What you can do is change yourself. Change how you think. Change what your attitudes are. Connect your, uh, your hopes and your aspirations and your joy back to Allah Azza wa Jal because He gives and He takes. And sometimes when He takes, even that is a form of giving. The child is gone, but a kawthar has been given. A kawthar has been given. SubhanAllah. And when that's been given, what does He say? Inna shani'aka huwa abta. Your enemy, the one who has shana'an towards you. Shana'an in Arabic means animosity, hatred. The one who has shown you hate and animosity. He's the one who is ultimately the most discontinued. Don't you worry about that. I'll take care of it. I got this. You worry about prayer and sacrifice. I'll worry about your enemy. So what are we learning? Stop worrying about the people who hurt you. Worry about Allah. And let Allah worry about the people who hurt you. You understand? This is a, it's the shift in mentality in this remarkable, remarkable short surah. As if to say, because the only thing the Prophet could hear, imagine the scene, as Abu Dhab is walking out, laughing, out on the top of his lungs, on the top of his lungs, the baby's dead. Finally, no one to carry his name. The house is ringing with these painful, poisonous words. The walls are shaking with these words. And the Prophet is told, don't you worry, that ain't nothing. That's not your problem. You just start praying. And he might even be praying while he's hearing those words. While those words are going in his ear. And they have no effect. We are being taught to grow a thick skin. People will say painful things, and Allah will give you the strength to be able to hear them and not be impacted by them. I'm not asking you to think that your husband is Abu Dhab. Okay? or Umm Dahab over here or something, actually. That's not what I'm asking you to think. But I, the Prophet in the Qur'an, what, what the Qur'an does is gives us the most extreme situation, and you compare your situation to that situation, and you realize mine is a lot easier. Right? That's why the hardest situation is described. Because, because when you compare yours to it, I compare mine to it, you realize our situation is way, way easier. So if this was good enough for the hardest situation, it must be good enough for us. You understand? That's the, that's the rationale, that's the thought process behind these <coughs> remarkable surahs. So at the end of the day, this surah is about being positive. This surah is about thinking, changing, you know, what you're focused on. What you think about all day, is, it drives your emotions, it drives your behavior, it drives your personality. Listen to what I'm saying. What you think about all day, it transforms your personality. If you're thinking about how angry you are with your wife, or how angry you are with your husband, it'll impact your personality. Your whole personality will be colored by those thoughts. Allah Azza wa Jal wants to transform our thoughts. He wants our thoughts to be dictated by His comforting words. That's what He wants. The more Qur'an you take in every day, not quantitatively, qualitatively, 
The more Qur'an you listen to, the more explanation of Qur'an you listen to, the more the words of Allah you think about, it will make dealing with everyday life easier. It will make the challenges of your life easier. Because every time you're feeling discomfort, you will find comfort in the word of Allah. Every time you need to hide away and find some refuge, you'll find refuge in the word of Allah. It will be your multahad, as the Qur'an calls it. A place to hide out. It will be, you can hide in Allah's words. They'll just cover you, wrap you up like a blanket. And they'll give you comfort. This is the relationship Muslims were supposed to have with the Qur'an. You know, as I end this talk, what I want to share with you is that people give lectures like guilt trip lectures about our relationship with the Qur'an. Like you don't even know Arabic. You don't even know what's being recited in the Salah. How can you have khushu in your prayer? You know, you should... There are the people who, for example, used to be drunk. Allah said, حَتَّى تَعْلَمُ مَا تَقُولُونَ don't, don't come near the prayer while you're drunk. لَا تَقْرَبُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْتُمْ سُكَارَةً Don't come near the prayer if you're drunk until you know what you're saying. And unfortunately, alhamdulillah, we're not drunk, but we still don't know what we're saying. Right? So, you know, people... And I've done this too in the past. Like, you know, I mean, you feel guilty about not knowing Quran. Because I'm frustrated as a young, stupid man, and I give talks about how you should feel guilty. But you know what I talk about now? When I say you, you and I should be building a relationship with the Qur'an, man, we need counseling. We need somebody's comforting words. We need somebody to come along and say, you know, it's going to be all right. And nobody will give us that other than Qur'an. Not like Qur'an. It will give you more comfort than you ever experienced in your life. Ever. What Allah can tell you, nobody else can tell you. Nobody else can tell you. You just got to look for it. You gotta look for it. You don't think it's there. You think all that's there is technical information, or stories of prophets, or history, or law, or this or that. No, what's in the Quran? قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ You know, it's, what has come to you is مَوْعِظَة a, a kind of advice that goes deep inside the heart. The heart. Uh, al wa'ad in Arabic actually means words that penetrate the heart. So a powerful word that goes deep inside the heart. What are our, most of our problems? In our hearts. There's anger in the heart, frustration in the heart, guilt in the heart, shame in the heart. There's regret in the heart, resentment in the heart, hatred towards someone in the heart. The desire for revenge is inside the heart. Jealousy is in the heart. Greed is in the heart. Temptation is in the heart. It's all in the heart. And he says, I'm going to give you some words that will go deep inside where? Your heart. But even if they go inside, what are they going to do? Well, once you put, get inside, it needs to start healing. So the next words are, وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي And it's going to start healing whatever lies in the chest. He doesn't say, شِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الْقُلُوبِ Because it will not only heal your heart, it will actually start healing everything around your heart too. It will like, take over your chest. That's why, أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكْ And then he says, وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً So then on top of that, it's guidance. On top of that, there's instruction on how to keep your heart healthy. And it's an act of love and mercy and care from Allah that He gave you these words. That He gave you this Qur'an. You're just missing out. How many people email me, call me, talk to me and say, I need to talk to someone. I need to talk to someone. I was like, yeah, you do. <laughs> and He really wants to talk to you. And He sent you a pretty long message. He sent you a really beautiful message for you. For you. Fihi dhikrukum. In it is your story. Allah literally says about the Quran, in it is your mention. It's talking about you, not someone else. Not some historical figure. Develop that emotional bond with the book of Allah and your life is going to transform. It really will. This is what it did for the Prophet What a way to deal with that crisis. Don't worry about it. Your enemy, be taken care of. They'll just be taken care of. فَصَلِّ لِيَوْتِكَ وَالْحَرْءِ إِنَّا شَانِي but the, the thing I really like you to remember from this talk, inshallah, is the connection between Ibrahim السلام, and Rasulullah السلام, with that light, when you study the Quran, a lot of things start becoming clear. A lot of things start becoming clear. You know, there are people who try to sell to you that the mission of the Prophet السلام, was to establish a government, to establish a state, to establish empire, to establish this, this, and they make these political claims about the Quran. Study the Quran and what you're going to find is the mission of the Prophet وسلم, was to complete the legacy of Ibrahim is irrefutable. It is irrefutable. And that's what we have to internalize. Ibrahim السلام, was willing to leave everything for Allah. He was willing to leave everything for Allah. We're not asked to leave everything. I'm not asked to put a knife to my child's neck. 
I'm not asked to leave my family in the middle of a desert. I am, I am asked much, 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 much less, much less than was it, what Ibrahim was asked. So if I'm part of that legacy, because of his dua, he made things easier for his children, not harder. We're grateful to our father Ibrahim السلام, and his son Muhammad وسلم, that we have the most beautiful, beautiful religion of hope. People keep telling you you're, 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 you're evil, you're wrong. People keep telling you you can't even feel bad. Some people say, why are you crying that your child died? You should have sabr. Shame on you telling somebody that. They should be able to cry. They should be able to cry. They're entitled to cry. That has nothing to do with sabr. The Prophet cried. The Prophet cried over his son as he was drowning. He cried out. He screamed. You know? He even begged Allah. How are you going to say you shouldn't feel bad or shouldn't feel sad? People are entitled to feel sad. Allah didn't send angels on the earth. He sent human beings and they have emotions. And Allah respects and acknowledges those emotions in the Quran. This is why it's guidance that goes inside the heart. Because Allah knows what you're feeling. Allah acknowledges your emotions. People are entitled to their feelings. If you're feeling angry inside, you have a right to feel angry. But let's heal it. If you're feeling jealous inside, you have that. It came from somewhere. I can't make you feel bad about feeling jealous, but let's try to heal it with the word of Allah. Let's try to help it. Stop trying to make people feel guilty because they're not walking around angels. You're no angel either. You're not. May Allah Azza wa keep us from being judgmental of others. And may Allah Azza wa help every single one of us deal with the difficulties that we're going through in our families, in our personal lives, among our friends. And may Allah Azza wa make us a people of Al-Jawzah. Barakallahu alaykum. As-salamu alaykum.